Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Diplomatic History Channel here at New Books Network. I'm your host, Grant Golub. Uh, I'm an Ernest May Fellow in History and Policy um, with the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, and today, I am absolutely delighted to be joined um, by Professor Melvin Leffler, who is the author of the new book, Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush and the Invasion of Iraq, um, which was just published uh, this past month with Oxford University Press, right on the eve of the 20th uh, anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Uh, Mel is the an emeritus professor of American history at the University of Virginia. Uh, he's the author of several books on the Cold War and on U.S. relations with Europe, uh, including For the Soul of Mankind, which won the George Lewis Beer Prize from the American Historical Association, uh, and A Preponderance of Power, uh, which might be his most famous book, National Security, uh, The Truman Administration in the Cold War, which won the Bancroft Hoover uh, and Farrell Prizes. Um, more recently, Mel is the author of Safeguarding Democratic Capitalism, U.S. Foreign Policy and National Security, which was published in 2017. Uh, and he's a previous president of the Society for the Destroying of American Foreign Relations uh, and the dean of the College uh, of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia. Um, so Mel, it is great to be joined by you today. And thanks for, so much for coming on the podcast. I'm delighted to chat with you, Grant. Thanks for having me. Um, look forward to discussing the book with you. Absolutely. Um, so I think a great place for us to start um, is to really think about the context of the 2003 uh, invasion. And I think in order to do that, we need to go back a little bit uh, into the 1990s. Um, obviously, the invasion of Iraq um, you know, 20 years on, uh, still invites a lot of passion, a lot of emotion, especially in the United States, but also in the United Kingdom. Uh, these were extremely, this was an extremely controversial uh, decision. Uh, I think you call it the most consequential decision in American foreign policy uh, in the 21st century and, and in the post-Cold War era. Um, but, you know, despite that, we it's still important, I think, to really try and understand um, the, the the framework that policymakers were using uh, within the Bush administration um, when they were making this decision. So I want to go back in, a little bit into the 1990s, and, and you focus the book on President George W. Bush uh, in particular, um, which I think is a sort of, excuse me, which is a, you know, a bit of a a necessary corrective to, to previous works of history in Iraq and especially popular portrayals, uh, not only of the, the, the run up to the invasion in 2003, but also of the Bush administration as a whole um, that sort of um, that often make President Bush uh, look like he's not really in control of the administration or that, um, you know, he's sort of being, um, you know, misled or manipulated by people around him, like the vice president, uh, Dick Cheney, um, thinking about the 2018 uh, biopic of him called Vice, which really kind of leans into this interpretation. But I was wondering if you could, to start off, if you could talk about how um, sort of the U.S. experience with Iraq during the 1990s, not only um, during the Gulf War, of course, uh, in the administration of George H.W. Bush, uh, George W. Bush's father, but also broadly within the 1990s, how this impacts the way that George W. Bush thinks about Saddam Hussein and, and thinks about Iraq. Well, the, uh, the experience of dealing with Saddam Hussein was extra- extraordinarily frustrating and exasperating to Democrats and Republican policymakers uh, a lot. Certainly, uh, George H. W. Bush, Bush forty one, at the end of the Persian Gulf War, felt exasperated. Increasingly, um, he wanted and and hoped uh, to bring about regime change in Iraq, but uh, failed to do so. He very conscientiously, you might say, made the decision not to go to Baghdad at the end of the Persian Persian Gulf War. Actually, at that moment, not to pursue regime change, to stay committed to uh, to the announced policy of simply trying to bring about the territorial status quo ante. Uh, but in truth, George H.W. Bush uh, hoped uh, 
uh, that there would be uprisings in in Iraq that would lead to the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. And of course, there was extraordinary amount of, uh, of discontent and rebellion, uh, especially in, well, both in northern and especially so- southern Iraq, which Saddam Hussein put down mercilessly. And the United States actually did not intervene. And George H.W. Bush was not able really to bring about his aspirational hope to get rid of Saddam, to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Of course, at the end of the Persian Gulf War in 1991, there were a variety of UN resolutions calling upon Saddam Hussein to, in, to allow inspectors to, to assess and dismantle his weapons of mass destruction that required Saddam Hussein to abide by a number of additional provisions. Of course, the most important was to accede to uh, to inspections. And until he did so, uh, the UN imposed sanctions. Throughout the 90s, uh, the big generalization, of course, is that Saddam Hussein uh, tried initially to conceal his weapons of mass destruction. He lied about his weapons of mass destruction. Increasingly, there was more information about them, um, more and more and more, uh, more and and more weapons programs were identified, more and more weapons were dismantled. And by the late 1990s, most of the weapons had been destroyed and, and, pro- and, and properly identified. But no one knew that was, that, that was the case. And increasingly in 1996, 97, 98, there were exasperating encounters between the inspectors and Saddam Hussein's regime, which ultimately led to the withdrawal of the inspectors. Uh, the Clinton administration was in- incredibly frustrated. The Clinton administration in 1998 took s- significant military action to punish Hussein's regime for its entrance for what it was perceived to be its intransigence and recalcitrance, uh, but uh, and and the Congress of the United States, by overwhelming majorities, in fact by unanimous vote in the Senate, passed the Iraq Liberation Act, which provided uh, monies to uh, to support to support. Uh, Iraqi exiles to help them overthrow the regime. The official policy of the United States, which President Clinton embraced, was essentially regime change. And uh, but the administration was not able to devise any real uh, plan to bring about regime change. So at the end of that administration, there was enormous frustration and exasperation with Saddam Hussein as a result of a of a decade of defiance and recalcitrance and a widespread belief in 1999 and 2000 that now that the inspectors were gone, Saddam Hussein was again uh, re- was again building up his weapons of mass destruction programs and might again embark upon aggression. So there was a great a great deal of exasperation and frustration throughout the decade by George H. W. Bush and by Clinton uh, with regard to to dealing uh, with Saddam Hussein. And it should be said that Saddam Hussein worked very systematically to undermine the sanctions regime and to evade the sanctions regime, to divide America from its allies. And by the end of the decade, by by the year 2000, by the time George W. Bush uh, became, became president, uh, the coalition that had been so effective in 1990-91 was, total, was totally frayed.
so that was the the larger context when uh, when when George W. Bush uh, t- took office. And I'm sure you'll probably ask me more about uh, some of the neoconservative hawks who joined the administration and their gro- growing truculence during the late 1990s and what impact they may have had. This is an important part of my story. I'm glad to talk about it if you wish to. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we'll definitely get to that. Uh, in a few minutes, um, but I, I want to f- sort of zero in on Bush, uh, specifically George W. Bush, and, and think about um, the way that he perceives Iraq as he's coming into office in 2001 and sort of in that initial uh, period of his presidency before 9-11. What's his view of Iraq? What's his view of Saddam? Uh, and how how is he thinking about sort of the Iraq problem, so to speak? Well, that's a very good question, and it's uh, an important uh, part of the initial chapters uh, of my book. I show that uh, Bush was um, very cognizant of the brutality of Saddam Hussein's regime. He discussed Saddam Hussein in one of the the major debates that he had uh, with Al Gore. He put a a very substantial focus on the repressiveness and and brutality uh, of the the regime. Um, It would be fair to say that that, uh, George W. Bush detested Saddam Hussein and everything he stood for. Having said that, the important point to be made is that Iraq was simply not at the forefront of George W. Bush's agenda. To begin with, foreign policy was not at the forefront of George W. Bush's agenda. He was mostly, when he he assumed the presidency, he was mostly focused on domestic priorities like tax cuts. He did not focus much attention during the first eight or nine months of his administration on foreign policy. And amongst his foreign policy priorities, Iraq was not very high amongst them. I can discuss uh, what went on at, you know, amongst the principles um, the secretaries of state and defense, what attention they accorded to Iraq during these an initial months. But the important point in terms of George W. Bush was that, um, yes, he det- tested uh, Saddam Hussein. He saw Iraq as a problem, but it was not a significant priority for him whatsoever, even amongst all his foreign policy issues, which, as I just said, in themselves were subordinate to his domestic agenda. Right. So, you know, with thinking about Bush's overall uh, framework for foreign policy, you know, even though it's sort of taking a back seat uh, in in that first nine months of his of his uh, administration to you know domestic political priorities such as passing those two thousand one tax cuts and there's going to be another round in two thousand three. Um, what's the way that Bush overall thinks about U.S. foreign policy? I, I think that you know it's important to sort of unravel that a little bit and and so we can sort of see you know as as this develops later, especially after the September eleventh uh, attacks how Iraq sort of fits within his broader foreign policy worldview. Well, his, you know, as he, dis- he discussed foreign policy in, in, in two or three critical speeches uh, during the campaign, not more than that, and his focus was on rebuilding American military strength. Of course, uh, one should keep in mind that America's military strength was greater than uh, uh, almost all nations in the world at that time combined. But that was uh, one of the mantras was rebuilding America's military strength and transforming the military. There was much talk about the the revolution in military technology, which the United States uh, would need to embrace. 
and Bush very, very much uh, embraced that. He also was an ardent free trader. He believed in an open world in which the United States, in, in globalization, in which the United States uh, would have the right to trade and invest everywhere and was very, very committed to, to those notions uh, of, of an open world. In truth, uh, during the first months of his administration, if you look at what was being done inside the administration, the Condi Rice, his national security advisor, began working on a national security strategy statement uh, during the summer of 2001 before 9-11. And we have drafts of that. I discussed that in, in the second chapter of my book. And in truth, the, the generalizations that she put forth, it wasn't a completed document by any means, but the generalizations that she put forth were very much in tune with uh, the sort of bipartisan approach to an internationalist foreign policy that had characterized American foreign policy throughout most of the Cold War and beyond. The draft national strategy statement put an emphasis, yes, on building America's military strength, on an open world, on promoting freedom, on working uh, assiduously with allies. There was nothing terribly striking uh, about about uh, the the draft national um, strategy statement, and in truth, in my opinion, there was nothing particularly striking about George W. Bush's foreign policy agenda uh, prior to prior to nine eleven. Some people will 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 focus and should focus on some of the unilateralist actions of the administration, for example, um, renouncing the the Kyoto Climate Control Treaty, um, the scorn that the United States, that the administration showed toward the International uh, Criminal Court. These things are, are often highlighted as reflecting unilateralist impulses within the administration. And there's much truth to that. But the overall framework of the of, of George W. Bush and of Condi Rice was actually during these initial months to uh, try to work out a foreign policy agenda that so- solidified alliances, built up America's military strength, promoted um, democracy and freedom and encouraged international trade and globalization. You mentioned um, a lot of the advisors and the the, the senior members of, of President Bush's national security team uh, earlier in our conversation. Um, a lot of them sort of um, you know, to, to one extent or another, were part of this, quote unquote, neoconservative foreign policy movement. I was wondering if we could sort of unpack that a little bit. And if you could tell us what exactly neoconservatism is, because that might not be something some of our listeners are familiar with, and then talk about some of the members of, of Bush's national security team who were sort of broadly associated with that, with this movement and what they thought about Iraq, especially in the 1990s leading up to the uh, to the George W. Bush administration? Well, for the most part, neoconservatives were um, actually disillusioned Democrats who had migrated over toward the Reagan administration and toward supporting Ronald Reagan in the late 1970s and early 1980s because they supported a um, a, a, pro, a pro freedom agenda, an agenda that uh, that focused on spreading democratic capitalism, that articulated the need for a strong uh, foreign policy, and that and that built upon a framework that American power was essential for a stable, democratic, international 
world order. And um, the the during the 1990s, you know, some of the most prominent um, neoconservatives who are always mentioned were uh, or people like um, Richard Pearl and Paul Wolfowitz and uh, and Douglas Fife. These people, several of them, like like Paul Wolfowitz, uh, joined the administration as the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the number two position uh, in the Defense Department. He was renowned all through the 1990s as a as an ardent champion of 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 democracy promotion. He and many others uh, had signed a memorandum in 1998 calling for the overthrow of Saddam Hussein and looking toward building up um, American strength to support a more forward-looking uh, foreign policy and project projecting uh, American strength uh, around the world. Um, it's often stated that uh, these people had won a disproportionate influence inside the Bush administration, and two, they came into office um, se- seeking uh, re- regime change. So um, what's interesting and what I show, in my opinion, pretty convincingly, is that in the, in the run-up to the administration, meaning during the, the, the campaign, when some of these neocons uh, were participating in a, in a group of, amongst a group of advisors that were helping Condi Rice, uh, who was uh, spearheading the foreign policy pro- pro- program of the Bush administration during the, the campaign. It's often said that, um, you know, they were preoccupied with Iraq and with democracy promotion. But in fact, when you look at what they were saying and doing, Iraq was not a significant item on their agenda at all. I'm not saying that it was not an item they were concerned with. It was just not a high priority item. What's interesting is that, you know, during uh, Wolfowitz's confirmation hearing, I don't even think he mentioned Iraq. Um, During the initial months of the administration, uh, the the policy of the administration in in a vague sense was regime change that that can be said, but there was certainly no commitment to going to war to bring it about. There was no no war planning that went on. In fact, it was uh, an issue that the top policymakers in the administration were unable to agree upon during the first nine months uh, of the administration. The Iraq policy frustrated and exasperated them uh, as much as it had frustrated and exasperated policymakers uh, during during the, the Clinton years. So regime change um, was the policy of the United States during the latter years of the Clinton administration. And certainly George W. Bush would say in a general sense that regime change was the objective. But one needs to probe what, what that really means. Um, yes, these people wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein, but they had not worked out any effective plan to do so, and it was not a very high priority amongst them. Also, when talking about the neoconservatives uh, grant, one needs to keep in mind that uh, they did not dominate this administration. Dick Cheney was not a neoconservative. He was a conservative nationalist. Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, uh, was not a neoconservative. He was not interested at all in democracy promotion uh, along the lines of the of, of of the neoconservatives. Secretary of State Colin Powell was not a neoconservative. So the idea that neoconservatives 
dominated the administration or the making of, of policy, even dur- during these early months, simply is unfounded. Uh, Wolfowitz is all, often focused upon for good reason. Paul Wolfowitz had was an intellectual who wrote a great deal during the 1990s uh, for a substantial part of the, the latter 1990s. He was the dean of the School of Advanced International Studies uh, at Johns Hopkins. He wrote a lot about foreign policy, a lot about Iraq. He was a prominent, ardent supporter uh, of regime change. Um, and so he's often focused upon. But in truth, he was not a significant influence within the administration uh, during these initial initial months in office. So sort of moving ahead a little bit, how does 9-11, which you, you sort of devoted an entire chapter to in the book, how does that change Bush administration thinking uh, about foreign policy more uh, broadly, about terrorism, uh, but also then about Iraq uh, specifically? I mean, as we know, you know, Saddam wasn't affiliated with Al Qaeda. He wasn't involved in the 9/11 attacks. Um, but 9/11, as you argue, marks a significant turning point uh, in the Bush administration's, um, you know, well, in the history of the Bush administration, the history of the United States. Um, but also puts foreign policy at the top of the Bush administration's agenda. So, how does how does the how did the nine eleven attacks? really kind of shift the narrative and, and shift the, the worldview of the way that, that Bush and his administration uh, think about terrorism and, and think about Iraq? Well, I, I um, demonstrate uh, in the book that 9-11 is determinative. It's a, an astonishingly important event. It shocks. It angers it generates fear amongst the top policymakers. There is widespread view that it's, it is the first of many attacks. What I illustrate in the book is the profound apprehension in the hours, days, weeks, and months after 9-11 that there will be another attack. The intelligence is overwhelmingly suggestive that another attack uh, will will take place. I describe the development of a threat matrix that is presented to the president every single day, a threat matrix that identifies every suggestion of a forthcoming attack. And it is said, although I've not seen, and I think very few few people have seen the actual threat matrix uh, outside of uh, the intelligence analysts at that time, but it is said that there were every single day 40 or 50 items enumerated in the threat matrix that was presented to the president every single day. I spoke at length to Michael Morell, who was the president's daily CIA briefer during this period of time. And he acknowledges that in retrospect, the threat matrix was a terrible idea because it it simply presented so many threats that the president himself had to sort through and and think about each each day. Uh, But it illuminated the overwhelming a sense of threat that existed. I should also emphasize, uh, because it's too often ignored, that within weeks after the 9-11 attack, there was an anthrax scare inside the United States. Letters with anthrax spores began circulating in the mail. Several people, uh, postal workers, died of anthrax. Um, anthrax spores and letters showed up in Senate in the in the post office of the Senate office building. Uh, 
Senate and congressional buildings were closed down, were closed down. The Supreme Court was forced to move its own deliberations to another location because there was overwhelming apprehension that uh, that terrorists were circulating um, anthra- anthrax and that there could be a, a real biological or chemical attack in, inside the United States. There were false alarms inside the White House in which the top policymakers themselves believed that they had been exposed to various types of, of chemical weapons. Um, and so one has to understand how these threats converge during the weeks and months immediately after 9-11. No one knew the source of these anthrax spores. Grant, I might point out that even today, there's uh, a good deal of uncertainty about the source of these anth- these these letters with anthrax that were, that were circulated at the time. But they caused tremendous, tremendous commotion and apprehension about an imminent attack. Because in in a sense, um, all through the late 1990s, prior to George uh, W. Bush, within the intelligence community and amongst foreign policy experts, there had been growing concern and preoccupation with the possibility of, of chemical and biological attacks inside the United States by terrorists. So, and now, immediately after 9-11, it seemed that not not only were terrorists able to blow up the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, but might actually be able to undertake a chemical or biological attack in, inside the United States. One needs to grasp how significant this was at the time in terms of uh, of, of shocking and frightening policymakers. Uh, I talked to some of the bioterrorists, to a bioterrorist expert on on Dick Cheney's staff, a man named Seth Karras, who described the the fear, the fears, and the challenges of trying to come to grips with the you know what was the source of uh, of of these anthrax spores and what might it portend. So. This is what's going on in late late September, October, November of 2001. This is the time that atten- that that President Bush's attention gravitates to Iraq. I show in the book that at the time of 9/11, um, even though even though Paul Wolfowitz and Donald Rumsfeld informed the president that it might be a good idea to focus on Iraq as well as Al Qaeda and Afghanistan. President Bush systematically rejected such suggestions, rejected such suggestions. And if, for example, if you read his major speech to Congress and to the American people um, in, on, you know, on September 20th, I think it was, but all the statements right after, right after the, the attack. You will not find any focus on Iraq. And he, when he explains what happened on 9-11 to the American people, his emphasis is on al-Qaeda and on Afghanistan. But he also states very unequivocally that he is embarking on a global war on terror, that he will go after not simply the terrorists, but also the state sponsors. Now, initially, that key state sponsor, of course, is Afghanistan. It is not Iraq. Uh, But his attention, as I show in the book, gravitates to Iraq during this period of October and November of 2001. And the important point is to try to understand why his attention 
gravitates uh, to Iraq. It's not because people tell him that Saddam Hussein was linked to 9-11. In fact, Michael Morell, uh, his CIA briefer, again and again, emphasizes both to me in my interviews and also in his own memoir, he emphasizes it again and again. We told Bush that Saddam Hussein was not responsible for 9-11, that there was no, inc- no information at that time linking, linking him to al-Qaeda. Nonetheless, nonetheless, Bush's attention gravitated to Iraq. So what was the reason for this? And what I tried to show in the book was that there was a logic to this. The logic was as as follows. When American covert operators moved into Afghanistan and al-Qaeda fled from their training camps inside, uh, inside Afghanistan, the American intelligence analysts immediately discovered incontrovertible, abundant evidence that al-Qaeda actually was seeking weapons of mass destruction, was aiming to develop chemical and biological weapons. There was absolutely no doubt that that was their intention. At the same time, Information was flowing into the intelligence agencies that Saddam Hussein was, in fact, carrying on his biological and chemical weapons programs. This information, of course, subsequently turned out to come from suspect informers and was found to be untrue. But in terms of understanding policymaking, in terms of understanding the intelligence analysis and its impact on policy, what was important at the time was that information was there, that's, that, that al-Qaeda wanted weapons of mass destruction, information was there, that Saddam was working on such programs, there was Information, I mean, explicit information that Saddam, unlike any other leader in the entire world, was gloating over 9-11. And so the policymakers' attention gravitated to Iraq because they knew, one, al-Qaeda wanted to undertake additional attacks. Two, that al-Qaeda wanted to get weapons of mass destruction. Three, that Saddam Hussein might be a source of those weapons. Four, that Saddam Hussein was involved with many terrorist groups, if not al-Qaeda. It wasn't that they were focused on al-Qaeda. It was that Saddam Hussein did have extensive relationships with many terrorist groups And there was a fear, therefore, that Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, whatever they might be, his chemical and biological programs, um, could find their way into the hands of terrorists who would seek to inflict harm on the United States or its allies. This was the great preoccupation in September, October, November, December 2001, when the president asks his Secretary of Defense and General Tommy Franks, the head of Central Command, to begin to develop a war plan for possible use against Saddam Hussein's Iraq. But as I emphasize in the book, and it's a very important part of my book, war planning does not initially mean going to war. And I can talk a lot more about this if you if you wish me to. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. And, and that's something that I think we, we should talk about. You know, I'm <clears throat> in the research that I do uh, on on the War Department and in World War II, uh, 
you know, it, there's all sorts of war plans, you know, for example, in the interwar period, as I'm sure, as I'm sure, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. across, a, across, a, with across a range of hypothetical scenarios and potential enemies that include uh, countries like the UK that, you know, you would never imagine the United States going to war with. But up until the mid 1930s, you have senior U.S. military figures predicting that a con- uh, an armed conflict between the United States and Britain uh, is entirely possible, um, you know, due to economic tensions. I mean, we're talking about people like Ernest King, who, you know, becomes the chief of naval operations in 1942. Right. right? So, so, so I Grant, think that's a really good point. But yes, go ahead, please. I mean, one of, the, one of the important things in terms of putting policy in context at that time is to recognize how exasperated President Bush was, and in truth, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld and others as well, how exasperated they were right after September 11th when they recognized they had no effective plan whatsoever on the books to really deal with the al-Qaeda training camps inside Afghanistan. They had no effective, quote unquote, war plan for Afghanistan. Uh, This causes tremendous consternation and infighting in those first days and weeks uh, after 9-11. And Bush is actually infuriated by the absence of a plan and by the length of time it takes a few weeks to really go into action and and move into Afghanistan. So one of the reasons he turns attention to to making a war plan after um, after the 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 seeming success in Afghanistan was that the United States would be prepared to take action against Saddam Hussein's Iraq in the future should he decide to do so. He might do so based on that configuration of information uh, that I just described that was coming that was coming into uh, the intelligence agencies and the Defense Department and the State Department. Um, he he needed to be prepared. So what is very interesting and little and little known is that when General Tommy Franks go goes to Crawford, Texas during Christmas 2001 to talk to President Bush and to lay out the first iteration of the war plan, Tommy Franks says in interviews, not to me, but to others who have interviewed him, and and, and this is uh, available at the uh, Oral History Project of, of the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. It's not my interview. Uh, General General Franks explicitly says, when I met with George W., when I met with the president to discuss the first iteration of the war plan, I left not thinking that we would necessarily go to war, but believing that should we go to war, we would be able to to have taken the right steps to implement the plan effectively. In other words, General Franks was saying the idea was to develop a war plan, but not necessarily to go to war. And several times when you read when you read um, General Franks' memoir carefully and when you read his interview at the Miller Center, President Bush says to him again and again during the months that follow, just because we're war planning, General, doesn't mean we're necessarily going to war. And this leads in my book to a long discussion um, that you may wish to engage me in about uh, the notions of coercive diplomacy, because developing a war plan and deploying American strength in the Persian Gulf region um, was part of what the policymakers thought was a strategy of coercive diplomacy, a strategy uh, 
that I strongly criticize in the book itself for a number of important reasons. Before we talk about coercive diplomacy, which, you know, as you say, is a, is a really big part of your book, I was wondering if you could sort of talk about, I think, something that's often not discussed enough when thinking about why uh, the Bush administration decides to invade Iraq, and that's the the speed and success with which the U.S. topples the Taliban regime in Afghanistan in October and November of 2001. How does that impact uh, Washington's thinking around doing something similar with Saddam in Iraq? That, that's a, a, a very important point, and I emphasize that in my book. Um, as you know, the three big themes of my book are fear, power, and hubris. Um, fear of another attack, power, meaning the belief that the United States um, could achieve what it wanted to achieve through military force uh, if it committed itself to doing that, and hubris, the sense that if the United States um, took military action, American troops would be met with jub jubilation. Um, but yes, it's a very important point that the, the, the quick perceived success in Afghanistan hugely encourages policymakers to think that they might be able to use force in other circumstances to achieve their objectives. Keep in mind, as I think you're suggesting, Grant, uh, correctly suggesting, that for a week or two or three weeks, the administration seemed to be very much bogged down in Afghanistan. There was tr tremendous um, uh, discussion in the press that this is once again going to be a quote, end quote, quagmire, like the one in, Viet in Vietnam. But then suddenly, the trajectory of the, of, of the war changed inside Afghanistan during the latter part of November, and with in incredibly swiftly, American forces in conjunction, special forces, use of air power in conjunction with the so-called Northern Alliance in, in Afghanistan, um, topples the Taliban government far more quickly, far more swiftly than anyone had anticipated. That is followed then with a fairly quick effort to, you know, establish a new government uh, inside uh, Kabul uh, that comes uh, comes about as a round of bring, as a result of bringing together many different Afghan factions uh, that leads to the establishment of Karzai's government. Um, all of this is seen at the time during November, December of 2001 and January and February of 2002 as an, as an unimaginable success. And of course, it encourages and inspires policymakers to think that they um, might, might achieve similar success elsewhere if they take such action. But I show in the book that, um, that for many months, the president himself, who was the shaper of policy um, was not was not himself committed to going to war in Iraq. Um, he had different hopes, and yes, he he hoped to get rid of Saddam Hussein, um, but he also placed a tremendous focus on getting control of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. One of the points of my book um, is to analyze very carefully how these two declared goals, regime change and control of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, were in a sense competing priorities for President Bush, and he never really resolved which of those two 
was his overriding preoccupation. And this hampered his ability to pursue what he liked to call, and Condi Rice liked to call, coercive diplomacy, because there was not agreement on the overriding on on the overriding goal. Was it regime change or was it gaining control of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction? And I show very clearly how often President Bush gravitated from one of these goals to the other goal without carefully delineating or thinking through which one was his priority. Having said that, what's also very important in the unfolding story is that regime change and gaining control of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction did not necessarily mean democracy promotion. Um, And one of the striking aspects of the policymaking process during these many months from December 2001 to March of 2003 was that democracy promotion was not defined, not defined as an overriding goal of whatever what of whatever action might be taken. In fact, one of the really interesting things is that when Tommy Franks and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld first meet and define the assumption of goals for the war plan for Iraq, they list two things, regime change, weapons of mass destruction. Regime change did not mean promoting democracy or freedom. It meant getting rid of Saddam Hussein, uh, believing that if you got rid of Saddam Hussein, you'd probably be be able at the same time to garner the information and gain control of of his alleged weapons of mass destruction. What's interesting in this entire process was that the promotion of democracy or freedom is not perceived as an overriding goal of coercive diplomacy, even though, key point, even though President Bush himself does want to promote freedom and democracy if, if, he, if he makes the decision to deploy combat troops to Iraq. That is not his motivation. His motivation is to prevent another attack to protect the American people, to avoid another 9-11, to make sure there is not another humiliation of the the United States. Those are his overriding motivations. But but he he feels that if action is going to be taken against Iraq in order to deal with those fears and concerns, that the result of the action should be to promote freedom and democracy inside Iraq. However, as I show in the book, many of his key advisors, and most importantly, Donald Rumsfeld, does not embrace that goal at all. And most of the planning for Iraq takes place without a careful examination whatsoever of what is required to promote democracy and freedom in Iraq, even though that was the president's goal. But he does not insist on planning for the achievement of that goal. So I think that kind of is a good segue into into thinking about why this idea of coercive diplomacy or this framework of coercive diplomacy doesn't really work to achieve uh, President Bush's objectives. And, you know, as as Robert Zollick points out in his review of your book in the Financial Times, um, you know, which, which you talk about in the book as well, you know, the problem, I'm quoting now, the problem with coercive diplomacy is that a diplomacy fails, coercion must follow unless one is willing to back down. So does that is this is this framing of Iraq policy around this this strategy of coercive diplomacy? Is this 
sort of from the get go, not really going to work because you're sort of putting yourself into a corner of having to follow through on military action if you're not able to achieve your ends through, you know, sort of diplomatic means, which, you know, for which seemed unlikely with, you know, a recalcitrant actor such as Saddam, which we've been talking about this whole time, it continuously frustrated American policymakers for, you know, not only, you know, the 15 years sort of prior to 2003, but but for decades, really. Well, as, 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 as you know from reading the book, I'm very, very critical of policymakers for not carefully examining the costs and consequences of the application of coercive diplomacy before they embarked upon that so-called strategy. However, at the same time, it needs to be emphasized that the idea behind coercive diplomacy was to intimidate Saddam in order to force him to open up Iraq for the return of inspectors in order to gain certainty about his weapons of mass destruction, that he would declare and relinquish it or make make it uh, or clarify that he did not have them. The, the idea was to intimidate Saddam to invite inspectors back into or allow inspectors to come back into Iraq to do their job. In fact, as I show in the book, and which is almost always obscured in many other accounts, almost everyone believed that it would take intimidation and the threat of military force in order to get Saddam to invite back the inspectors. Um, not, you know, not only Tony Blair, but actually Jacques de Chirac agrees with this. And most importantly, Hans Blix, the head of the UN inspection teams, explicitly says again and again that the use of, or not the use, but the threat of force was indispensable to get Saddam to open up and to allow back the inspectors. And in fact, in fact, in fact, that is what happens in August, September, and October, and November of 2002. The, the threat of force combined with the passage of a new UN resolution, which President Bush, which is the diplomatic aspect of coercive diplomacy, um, forces Saddam or, or encourages Saddam, I should say forces Saddam, um, to allow back the inspectors, which otherwise he would not have allowed. Now that that and and Bush actually one of the interesting things that I found from the use of British documents is that Bush makes very clear to Tony Blair who presses him on this that you know if Saddam really does if Saddam really does cooperate and collaborate with the inspectors and demonstrates that he either does not have weapons of mass destruction or he has destroyed them or, re, or clearly relinquishes them, that Bush says explicitly numerous times to Tony Blair, he recognizes that if those things are accomplished, he would not insist on the removal of Saddam Hussein. In other words, he would have to take yes for an answer with regard to weapons of mass destruction. If they could get what they wanted to know about weapons of mass destruction, Bush acknowledged numerous times that he would be willing, grudgingly willing, to accept the survival uh, of, of the regime. Uh, neither he nor Tony Blair believed that that was a likely outcome, but it would depend on Saddam's cooperation. And so it was really up to Saddam, who actually 
exerts some important influence on what happens here. If Saddam had acted otherwise, um, the decision to invade Iraq uh, might not have taken place. And that's an important consideration here. At the same time, as you suggested, it's also very important to realize that once Bush embarked on this program and threatened the use of force, if Saddam ultimately remained recalcitrant and defiant, President Bush would have to carry out his threat. And um, Bob Zellick, in his review in the in the Financial Times, you know, emphasizes that one has to be very, very cognizant of the fact that when you threaten force, your credibility becomes vested in that. And that is exactly what happens. And, and I demonstrate that uh, in the book, that credibility in January and February becomes a major preoccupation of President Bush and Vice President Cheney. They, they say that explicitly. Credibility becomes a, pre- a preoccupation when they continue to believe that Saddam Hussein is toying with them, is playing chicken with them. And in their view, in the view of Bush and Cheney, they think that Saddam thinks that he's winning this game of uh, of chicken. And that's sort of, you know, an interesting part of the end game of my story here about what is actually happening in January and February of, of 2003. <laughs> You know, we've spent uh, this almost or this entire conversation thus far, you know, thinking about the American side. Um, I think that it's important to to give a little bit of time to to thinking about the Iraqi side. I mean, you, you have a chapter of the book on Saddam. You know, how is Saddam interpreting American actions during this whole period? Obviously, he's not just a, a passive actor, you know, but I think a lot of people don't really understand what Saddam's thinking about, uh, thinking about the United States is in this period, why he, you know, kind of continuously underestimates, um, you know, Bush administration decision making, and he doesn't think that the United States will, you know, invade his country or follow through on these coercive threats. Threats. I mean, given his experiences with the United States in the period between the Persian Gulf War and the 2003 invasion, and the actual Persian Gulf War itself, in your view, why does he get this so wrong? I mean, why does he think that the U.S. will just back down? Well, that's a great question, and um, I, I deal with this uh, in in the book in in various places. Uh, but I I must admit that this re- this remains a dilemma and perplexing not only to me but to every observer who <laughs> who tries to, tries to understand uh, what happened. So we have captured Iraqi documents, and we have. Um, extensive interviews with some of uh, Saddam's subordinates and and minions and generals um, uh, after the war. And I I use some of these documents and I use um, the interviews that have been uh, that have been collected and published. We also have it it should be stated um, uh, Saddam's tapes. Saddam actually did tape uh, some, uh, many of his meetings or some of his meetings uh, with his advisors and subordinates o- over the years. Met most of those tapes um, are actually from the 1980s and 1990s and not from the period 2001, 2002. But what we can see um, to answer your, your question explicitly is Saddam believes that the United States is a paper t- a tiger, that the United States is cowardly, that the United States is not willing to incur significant casualties to achieve its objectives. And what he thinks about is that the United States could easily have ha- have used its military power in 1991 to go to Baghdad and to overthrow him. But the United States did not. The United States could have intervened to help the Shia uprisings in 1991, but the United States did not do so. The United States intervened in Somalia, but then 
pulled out. Uh, the United the, the United the United States um, only intervened sporadically and with the use of air power um, in the in the Balkans in the late in, in the late nineteen eighties. The United sorry in the late nineteen nineties. Um, the, the United States, when it took action, when Clinton took action, he used air power, but he was not willing to put at risk the lives of American troops and, Amer- and American soldiers. Saddam saw all of this. He says this to his advisors again and again, that the, Uni- the United States doesn't have the fortitude, does not have the stomach to really do what it is threatening to do. It is mind boggling, Grant. It really is that as the United States is deploying in, in, in November, December 2002 and January, that the United States is deploying um, significant forces and Saddam is still saying to his, advi- to his advisors that, oh yes, the United States might take action. They might bomb again. They might destroy some of his facility, military facilities, his radar, his infrastructure, but the United States isn't really going to deploy troops and topple him. And he partly thinks that the threat, that the perceived threat that he possesses chemical and biological weapons is a deterrent. And, um, and so all along, he, he, he believes that even though he had destroyed the weapons, he never acknowledged that he has destroyed them because he believes that the widespread perception that he still has weapons of mass destruction would act as a deterrent against the United States and also was a critical part of his power domestically vis-a-vis his Shia and Kurdish opponents because he had used chemical weapons uh, uh, um, against them in the past, um, and that it, that the perception that he had those weapons of mass destruction was also a deterrent to Iran. So he doesn't really acknowledge uh, that he's gotten rid of them. It's so interesting and what's so so hard to analyze is that we do know that in January and February of 2003, as American troops and British troops are actually deploying to the region, he does tell his subordinates to cooperate with the inspectors. And there is more and more cooperation. But we know from his subordinates who have talked to uh, uh, American interrogators that they themselves were uncertain. Yes, Saddam said, cooperate, and I don't have weapons of mass destruction. But his own subordinates did not really believe him, and they were uncertain. They were uncertain whether they should or should not cooperate, because they all always always knew that Saddam spoke through you know in many different ways and that getting things wrong getting things wrong would endanger their own lives so you know one of the the really perplexing aspects of of this and why you can't really assess this as a rational actor sort of is that there is so many contradictory impulses coursing through Saddam Hussein and the fact that he had been such a tyrannical, brutal leader meant that his own subordinates didn't actually know what to be doing at a critical point in time. Yeah, you know, as we're coming to the, the end of our of our conversation here, Mel, I was, I was wondering if you could talk to us about really what the lessons of the way the Bush administration planned for the, the war and how it and how President Bush decided uh, to to actually invade Iraq, you know, what what should we really be taking away from this? I mean, we've been spending 20 years talking about this, but, you know, on the flip side, with two decades of, of removal now from uh, from the decision, you know, what, what are really the big takeaways from the way that Washington planned for this war? And well, how should we think about the Iraq War today? Well, I'm 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 so, I'm so glad you you asked this question because um, it's really important to to reflect on this. So I would I would say um, there are numerous 
lessons um, to extrapolate Grant. First of all, um, policymakers and the American people need to modulate their fears. Um, there was overwhelming apprehension of another attack, and um, and there was good reason for the apprehension, but it, at least in retrospect, we can see totally exceeded um, the threat that Saddam Hussein himself um, portended uh, at, at, at the time. So um, along with modulating fears, it would be extremely important to say that part of that is to re-examine basic assumptions. So the basic assumption, of course, that was wrong, woefully wrong, was that Saddam still had weapons of mass destruction. And although the evidence for that at the time was ambiguous, and the policymakers I show in the book knew that the evidence was ambiguous. Nonetheless, they firmly believed that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. I show very clearly that Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Powell, every single important policymaker believed that Saddam had we weapons of mass destruction. Why do they believe it? Because he had had weapons of mass destruction. He had employed weapons. He had lied about them, etc. So one of the key things is how important it is to step back and re-examine basic assumptions. Now, that's easy to say. But Grant, how many of us really step back and re-examine basic assumptions? And yet, and yet, you know, that's you know one of the stories here. You know, some of the people who hate George W. Bush need to step back and re-examine some of their basic assumptions. Those who sort of admire what he did need to step back and re-examine their, their assumptions. These things are hard to do, but for policymakers, we can see how important it was for them to have taken the time to really re-examine basic assumptions, however difficult it is. Another lesson, grasp the limits of American power. There was a huge overestimation of what the United States could accomplish inside Iraq by President Bush himself. The, he believed that if he went to war, he could promote freedom, that, America, uh, that, they, that the exertion of power would be successful, and that the United States soldiers would be embraced jubilantly by Iraqis. And so another lesson is to curb one's hubris. American policymakers need to curb their hubris, curb their sense of superiority that everybody around the world wants to embrace fundamental American institutions. Another lesson, analyze consequences and costs. One of the glaring things about the decision making was that there was very little systematic examination of the consequences and costs of an invasion. Another lesson, clarify goals. During this period of time, the, the, as I said earlier, it was not clear whether the overriding goal was regime change, weapons of mass destruction, destruction, or democracy promotion. And it's important to clarify goals and define priorities. Then, of course, you have to link means and ends. One of the stories here is that if the president wanted to promote democracy and reconstruction in Iraq, the United States needed to develop the means uh, to do that. And that, that clearly um, was, was, was not done. I would also say a key lesson grant is the importance of excellent staff work. One of the striking things when you look at the at the decision making process was that the opponents of war, 
inside the administration, some of the people, for example, inside the State Department, who really were relatively skeptical of the prospective benefits of, uh, of an invasion, did not make their case effectively. One of the most important memos written this period of time was one that came out of the Near East Division of the Department of State called A Perfect Storm, which really was an effort to sort of delineate um, the deleterious consequences that might emerge from an, from an invasion. But I invite people which is av- to, to read this memo, which is available now. One can get it uh, on, on the internet pretty easily. It wasn't available for a long time, but now it is. It is a terrible memo. It's a terrible memo because there is no effort to systematically define what really are the most important consequences of an invasion that one needs to think about. It was simply a laundry list of things that could go wrong pre-invasion, during an invasion, after invasion, with no careful assessment. Staff work is really important in order to have good policy. So those are some of the critical things I would emphasize. Well, I think that's a great place um, for us us to leave it. A lot of a lot of really useful lessons um, for policymakers in, in Washington and and in other places as well to think about when when considering really weighty foreign policy decisions, especially uh, as the U uh, as the U S and the world uh, is you know facing uh, the one year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, increasingly hostile tensions uh, with China and a host of other really important uh, global problems. One of the things, I would, one of the things, Grant, that I would just say in conclusion uh, is that what I try to do in this book and what I think is important for everybody uh, to do is both to empathize with the way policymakers see the world in their context, but also then to be able to step back and objectively criticize the things they did, given what they knew at that time. And this book tries to do both. And as a result of that, I think you can extrapolate real lessons from 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 this experience. Mm. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and I think that, you know, 20 years removed from this decision and in, in the years and decades moving forward, we're, we're, we're going to continue to grapple uh, with why the Bush administration decided to invade Iraq and its uh, implications and consequences, not only for American foreign policy, uh, but for the world uh, as well. So the book is Confronting Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush and the Invasion of Iraq. It was published uh, in February 2023 with Oxford University Press. Uh, The author is Melvin Leffler, one of America's preeminent diplomatic historians. Uh, Mel, thank you so much again for coming on the pod, and uh, we will see you all again very soon. Thank you, Grant. Thank you.